and to take the exam, not just look at it, not just review it, take 90 minutes and actually complete the exam. Yes. I'll do my best. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I don't think you ever tell a student, no, you can't ask a question. So yeah, I mean, come ask whatever you want. I don't know if I'll be able to answer it, uh, but, but I'll do the best I can. Uh, I'll stay here till I, you don't need me anymore. All right, so if you're here, uh, you might have to wait, but I'll answer your questions. Fair? Um, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, you gotta come here. So be, be here or be square, as they say. Um, questions on that? All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was my most recent uh, midterm I've given. Um, we will also do on the last day of class a review of one of my old final exams. This is just a review of a midterm, but it should give you a sense of where you are. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, you get a bit of a reality check, see, see if you're up to snuff. But definitely, please take 90 minutes and, and complete the exam beforehand. All right, any questions? All right. I want to begin class with a review. Um, this topic is not pleasant. And the reason why this topic is not pleasant is because the Supreme Court has completely messed it up, right? There are all these different tests which don't exactly follow from each other. And we're often left scrambling, sort of scratching our heads, thinking, how on earth do we do a takings question? So my goal today is to walk you through the cases through 2022, uh, 2002. The more recent cases get a little bit more messy. So far, we studied, before class today, four cases, right? First, we did how to check, right? Remember, how to check concerned a ban on baking bricks, a ban on baking bricks, okay? Was that a taking? No. The Supreme Court held that harmful or noxious uses might be called a nuisance can be prohibited. That various harmful or noxious uses can be prohibited. All right, that's how to check. The next case we studied is Penn Coal, the Mahon. Okay. Penn Coal was the case that involved mining of coal underneath a home. Right, that involves subsurface rights. In Penn Coal, the court held that compensation was required. Why? In the words of Justice Holmes, the regulation went too far. The regulation went too far. Far. Why did it go too far? Holmes didn't say exactly, but we generally infer that the value was diminished too much, right? That the value of the coal under the ground became basically worthless. <laughs> so we might say that Penn Coal was something of a balancing test. This was not a bright line test, right? Holmes did not give us a clear standard of when there's a taking. This was sort of a balancing test. All right. The next case we studied is Penn Central. Please, 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 for the love of property, do not confuse Penn Coal and Penn Central. I know you will. I won't name names, but at least a couple of you will in the exam. Penn Coal involves coal, <laughs> and Penn Central involves Grand Central Station, the train station. So the name's there, but, but people just confuse them. Okay. Penn Central involved the, uh, a case where you want to build a tower on top of a train station. Did Penn Central use some sort of bright line rule? Of course not. Penn Central rejected that and said, we're going to use an ad hoc balancing test, right? And it gave these sort of three factors, one of which was our favorite, the Dibbies, the distinct Investment-backed expectations, the divvies. Okay. Mm 
Can you reiterate the third factor? Well, I don't have. Uh, just give me a second. I have to pull that up. You got me out of out of stride. Uh, right. So the first factor, just to re 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 rehash this, is the economic impact of the regulation on the property owner. Right. How much will this actually impact the property owner? The second factor is. How does a regulation interfere with the DIBIs, the distinct investment backed expectations? In other words, how much money has actually been invested in this use and how much did the regulation affect it? The third factor that Kurt just asked is the character of the governmental action. In other words, what is the government trying to do? In Penn Central, they were trying to preserve the historic beauty of the train station. They want more air, more sunlight, you know, make the neighborhood look great. Right, that's the character of the action. That, that answer your question there, Kirk? Yes, okay, good. Right, but what's important to stress for now is that Penn Central was a balancing test. It was not a bright line rule. Law students don't like balancing tests. I know that. They like bright line rules, don't they? Yes, you do. I know you do. The next case will give us one, which is Loretto. Right, what was Loretto about? Loretto involved a, um, a New York law that mandated the installation of wires, cables on buildings. They were drilled right into the, to the masonry, to the brick. The Supreme Court in Loretto found that there was a permanent physical occupation. That is, the wires were there forever, or at least close enough to forever for purposes of the of the case, right? The, that the wires have to remain there indefinitely. And this permanent physical occupation was there. Did the court care how much these wires diminished the value of the property? No. Did the court care about how important these wires were to the public interest? No. With Loretto, we get a bright line rule that if there's a permanent physical occupation, there is going to be a taking. You must provide compensation. You might call it, I'm sorry, you might say that there's no balancing, right? They don't care that the wire is only a, you know, half an inch thick and that no one's even going to notice it. <laughs> with the Loretto test, with the bright line rule. Right, so again, Penn Central, balancing. Loretto, bright line rule. Everybody with me? Everyone with me so far? All right, I want to introduce a term which you may have seen before, maybe you haven't. And that term is categorical, or more precisely, categorical test. What is a categorical test? A categorical test might also be called a bright line test or a per se test. Think of from torts negligence per se or defamation per se. If you fit a specific element, then there's liability 100%, right? If there's no balancing, you don't talk about duty of care or anything else. If there's negligence per se, there's liability. If there's defamation per se, there's defamation. Remember this? Does this sound familiar? In taking to a similar doctrine, if you fit into a certain category of facts, you have a per se taking. If you have a permanent physical occupation, again, if there's a permanent physical occupation, there's a per se bright line rule Taking. We say there's a categorical taking. You fit in that category, you have a categorical taking. Everyone with me. What do we make of Penn Central? Penn Central does not involve a bright line rule. Penn Central does not involve a per se rule. There's no categorical rule. It's all about open ended balancing. And let me just tell you guys if you're litigating under the Penn Central test, guess what? You're going to lose. Like 90%, you're going to lose. Justice Brennan wrote a Brennan opinion, which means that the property owner loses. That's what happened. So this entire debate in today's reading between Justice Scalia and Justice Stevens is really about who wins and who loses. If you get into a categorical test, you win. If you get into a Penn Central balancing test, you lose. So when Justice Stevens says, oh, we need to apply the guidepost from Penn Central, Drew is saying government wins. Right? That, that's what he's saying. And when Justice Scalia says, we need to have a bright line rule. He's saying government loses. 
So this is really sort of a proxy battle for who wins, who loses. Does the government win or does the government lose? Does the property owner win or does the property owner lose? But that's what these cases are about. And they do this between a categorical test on the one hand, like Loretto, and a balancing test like Penn Central on the other hand. OK. With me so far? Good? It's going to get ugly. All right. So let's, I gave you a flow chart in class last week, and it's so neat and clean. It's going to get all messed up today. Get real ugly, but we'll go through it one step at a time. So let's start here. How do you approach a takings case? So the first question you should ask yourself, and this is the easy one, right? Is there a permanent physical occupation? Is there a permanent physical occupation? Okay. If the answer is yes, under Loretto, you have to provide compensation. If the answer is yes, under Loretto, you must provide compensation. To be clear, this is a categorical regulatory taking. Categorical regulatory taking. There is no balancing, put that in big bold letters, no balancing involved, right? If there's a permanent physical occupation, like a Loretto, it's a categorical regulatory taking. You do not engage in balancing. If I give you a question involving Loretto in the exam, consider yourself fortunate because you stop right there. You know, it's like a monopoly. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Go right to go. Jump. You're done. You got to take. You got to pay up. But it's seldom that easy on my exam or in life. The government usually doesn't engage in these permanent physical occupations. Everyone with me so far? All right. So the second issue we have to ask ourselves: What if there is no permanent? physical occupation. Again, what if there's no permanent physical occupation? Okay, so we have some options, right? Call it option A. What if there's a harmful or noxious use, which you might also call a nuisance, right? What if there's a harmful, noxious use, which you might also call a nuisance? see why in Lucas today. Well, under the rule of had a check, no compensation. Again, under the rule of had a check, if there's a harmful or noxious use, there's no compensation. This is a police power exercise. Everybody with me? Okay. Now we have 2B. If there's no harmful or noxious use, if there's no harmful or noxious use, guess where we go? What's the test? Penn Central balancing. Exactly. We go to the Penn Central balancing test. Okay. So again, so far, it's actually pretty neat and clean. It's going to get ugly by the end of class today, but at least here it's pretty neat and clean. The first we ask ourselves, is there a permanent physical occupation? Yes, you're done. No, go to step two. Is there a nuisance or harmful, uh, obnoxious use? Okay, the government can restrict that without paying compensation. But if there's no harmful, obnoxious use, for example, the um, tower in Manhattan over the train station, you go to Penn Central Balancing and the government wins. It's just, it's going to happen. 100%, uh, 90%. Okay. So we have so far one categorical test, Loretto, and we have one balancing test, Penn Central. Everybody with me? The first case for today, Lucas, introduces a different categorical test, right? The first case today, Lucas, introduces a new 
categorical test. Now, Justice Scalia says this was based on precedent. Justice Stevens said, no, you're making this up. This was never actually used. We can talk about that later. But for your notes, the purpose of your notes, which you care about, there's something new you have to add to your chart, which is the Lucas test. All right. Everybody with me? All right. Who wants to me the facts on Lucas? Yes, go ahead, Aaron. Um, so South Carolina um, started managing its like uh, coastal areas uh, with a, uh, a piece of legislation called the Coastal Zone Management Act um, uh, in 1977 that uh, just required um, owners uh, of coastal land uh, to basically take environmental care, I think, um, kind of restricted the ways that they could use the land. Um, in 1986, uh, Lucas paid $975,000 for two residential lots. Mm -hmm. on what, what did he want to build there? Uh, just, I think, two uh, just like single family right, homes. Right, single family homes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it, that was on an island off the coast of Sarah, uh, South Carolina. Um, and so he, he was in, like, in the process of getting ready to build, but um, there was a new legislative act that came through the Beachfront Management Act, uh, which was enacted in 1988, mm -hmm. um, which effectively barred him from putting up any permanent habitable structures on those two lots. How long? Uh, it's like forever. Forever. As far as far as the law is concerned, time there was no duration. This was indefinite. All right, go on. Keep on. Um, so uh, <coughs> Lucas obviously had <laughs> took issue with that. Yeah. Uh, state trial court found that the act made Lucas's property, quote, valueless. Let me just pause here. This is an important point, right? The trial court in South Carolina said the land was valueless, right? Did, Aaron, did the Supreme Court of the state agree with that? Or did they, did they, did they make a finding whether land was valueless? valueless? Um, they disagreed. They sort of went with the legislative deference. No, they did, but did they make a finding whether the land was valueless? They have to look at our flow chart, right? If the government's regularly a noxious use, does it matter how much value is being deprived? No. Good. Right, let me pause right there. Okay, so that, that was very good. So Lucas buys his land in 86. Um, it's actually not clear if he intended to build right away. In fact, there's some evidence that he wanted to let the land appreciate in value. So we don't know if he was building right away, but he bought the land in 86. In 88, the government passes this new law that says we have these ecological crises no construction, no building, right? You cannot build here, okay? It turns out by 1990, they sort of changed their tune and they allowed perhaps some permitting exemptions, but at least for a period of two years, no construction was allowed. Lucas went to court and he argued that the government took away all the value of his land. Whether that's true or not, we'll get to later, okay? But the trial court at least made a finding that indeed the land was valueless. The state Supreme Court, though, didn't really address that point. The state Supreme Court went down the how check route. And the state Supreme Court said, when you're trying to police a harmful use, you don't need to provide compensation. And what was the harm here? Well, look, if you're building all this beachfront property, right, and a hurricane blows through, you could actually have the houses floating across the island this is not funny, just wiping people out, right? This happened with Hurricane Jose Hugo, where you had these structures that were on the beachhead by, this, by, by, by the shore, and all the debris from the houses washed through, knocked out all these sand dunes. People got injured. There were deaths or fatalities. Maybe you should have a barrier island serve as, and you suggest, a barrier to save Charleston, right, to absorb the impact of uh, any, any, any storms that come aboard. So th there was definitely, uh, according to the government, a need to have this land to be pure, not to be, you know, have all these uh, expensive constructions on it. Okay. But the trial court found it's valueless. Supreme Court reversed, and uh, the state Supreme Court reversed 
and said, this is a police power matter, and uh, this is a lawful exercise of eliminating a harmful use. In fact, the House is harmful. Okay. The case gets the U.S. Supreme Court. And the opinion here was very fragmented, right? Uh, you might say the vote was six to three, but not really, right? Um, Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion. He was joined by the Chief Justice and Justices White, O'Connor, and Thomas. Um, Justice Kennedy concurred in the judgment, right? And I want to just talk about Kennedy for a minute. Justice Kennedy said there was no permanent taking here, right? At most, he couldn't build for two years. So why are you giving him the value of the entire property, a million dollars? Just give him whatever the value might have been for two years of construction. So Kennedy raised the distinction between a temporary taking and a permanent taking. Did Justice Scalia make that point? No, he did not. Okay. Then we have Justice Souter, who is sort of this curious judge who didn't really do very much. He was just sort of this kind of like, you know, kind of like Forrest Gumpy just went out to the Supreme Court for no particular reason. Uh, I know the reason, uh, but but it wasn't, it wasn't a very good reason. Um, but Justice Souter would have dismissed the case. And his view, the record wasn't clear enough, right? A second, maybe not. One second, right? Justice Souter would have dismissed the case because the record wasn't clear enough. And the state Supreme Court never really passed on the issue of whether the land was valueless. Zach. So George Bush's, uh, President George Bush I, his uh, chief of staff was named Warren Rudman, Western New Hampshire. Lord help us. And Warren Rudman assured George Bush that David Souter was conservative because he was also from New Hampshire, these two New Hampshireites. Uh, Souter had been on the New Hampshire Supreme Court for a couple of years. Actually, one of his opinions is in your book. It was an implied warranty of habitability case. It's in your book somewhere. Um, and then Bush put him on the First Circuit for like five minutes, slightly exaggerating. And then Warren Rubin said, look, you can replace Brennan. This is your guy. This is your conservative guy. And he picked David Souter. It turned out to be a consistent liberal vote. So that's why we're the Federal Society. That never happens again. I'm only, only slightly exaggerating, but, but it's true. I mean, the reason why we have... The screening mechanisms to make sure we say no more suitors, never again. Uh, seriously, like the David Suter experience that a president could just pick someone on one person's recommendation who had no background is just would never happen again today. Instead, we got John Roberts. What do I know? By the way, you know, you know, who argued Tahoe Sierra, John Roberts. John Roberts argued on behalf of the government Tahoe Tah Sierra. He should. He was a very good advocate. He should have, should have stayed there. He was, he was very good. Uh, he was probably one of the best advocates in the country at the time. He's excellent. Anyway, back to the case. Zach, you have to raise your hand. All right. So again, the vote was 6-3, but, but, but not really. So the big debate, though, is between Justice Scalia for the majority and Justice Stevens in the dissent and also Justice Blackman in the relation in the dissent. All right. So at the beginning, Justice Scalia walks through the cases. He says, look, there... There's two general approaches to taking these cases. There is the balancing test, like Penn Colby Mahon, Penn Central, where we sort of look to say, you know, what's the public interest? What's the impact on the property owner, right? What is the, what is the right balance? And this is very open-ended, and there's not really a good way of describing how to resolve these issues. All right, so that's the balancing approach. And then Justice Scalia says we have this other test, this categorical test we have from Loretto, that if you meet certain conditions, there's going to be a taking no matter what. It doesn't matter how the public interest shakes out. It doesn't matter what the economic impact is. It doesn't matter what sort of distinct investment back expectations. We use a categorical approach. So again, you have the bright line rule from Loretto, and then you have the balancing test. Justice Scalia says there's actually another categorical test. And the court never actually applied it. They sort of stated it before. It's never been applied. Um, according to Justice Stevens, it was just dicta. We can argue about that forever. But five justices said there is another categorical test. So what is this categorical test? Okay. Where a regulation denies, and here's the money quote, all economically beneficial or productive use of the land where regulation denies all, all, that's the key word, all economically beneficial or productive uses of land. 
When I say all, I mean 100%. Where 100% of the economic value of a land is diminished, there is a per se bright line categorical regulatory taking. Again, where 100% of the economic value is diminished, there is a bright line per se categorical regulatory taking. Okay. Scalia said, when you have this bright line rule, you're not just adjusting the benefits and burdens of life, you are nuking the property value. Everything's gone. Okay. Scalia said it's rare, but it will happen. So the test is actually pretty straightforward. Now, wait a minute. Where does, where does the Lucas test fit in on our flow chart? Hmm. Anyone want to take a guess? Wouldn't that be easy? You're right. It's actually B. I'm going to make this one C. So in your notes, I'm sorry for those of you taking notes by hand, turn to B into 2C. Okay? And we're going to make a B here. I'm sorry if this is a messing up your outline. I, I know it's going to get even worse. So just put, leave a lot of space between it. We're going to add some more stuff today, guys. Um, Guess I want you to frame this one, right? Okay. If a regulation deprives all economically viable use, that is 100%, you follow the Lucas categorical test. There's no balancing. Bright line rule. Okay. If you deprive all economically viable use 100%, you apply the Lucas categorical test, there's no balancing that to be done. Everyone with me? But is that the whole rule? What about harmful noxious uses? What did Justice Scalia say about that? Did Justice Scalia overrule Hadachek? No, he didn't. Can the government still regulate harmful, noxious uses? Yeah, sure they can. All right. So I want you to modify this one one more time. So the test is actually two parts. If there is no harmful or noxious uses and regulation deprives all economically viable use, you follow the Lucas categorical test. We're not done. We have more in a minute. I want to see why you sit there, right? When you apply the Lucas test, you apply the Lucas test when there's no harmful, noxious use, and 100% of the value is diminished. Then you get to the categorical bright line rule. You got to take it. Everyone see that? Everyone see that? Okay. But then what about Penn Central, right? When do you apply the Penn Central test? You apply the Penn Central test when there's no harmful, noxious use, and it does not deprive all economically viable use. In other words, less than 100%. Everyone see what I just did there? I added an on 2C. You still follow the Penn Central test when there's no harmful or noxious uses and less than 100% is diminished. And that's what Penn Central said, right? Penn Central said, look, we still retain the value of the train station below. There's still some economic value and there's no harmful or noxious use. So then you're in Penn Central balancing land when the government wins. So let's look what we have here, right? We have Loretto, categorical test. We have Lucas, categorical test. And then we have Penn Central, balancing test. Right, these are the various standards that have been used by the court side cases. Everybody with me? Everyone with me? All right, now let's walk through actually why this test is sort of controversial. 
Justice Stevens makes a point, which I think has some merit, right? By the way, Justice Stevens, really smart dude. He served in World War II as a code breaker, right? He, he did encryption in the Pacific Fleet. This is a very smart person, clerk in the Supreme Court. I mean, he was very crafty. He was very crafty. Uh, there's no one like him anymore. Maybe Kagan's close, but there's no one who did what Stevens did. He was very effective what he did. Um, Justice Stevens made a point of why are we using this 100% standard, right? If a law deprives someone of 95% of his value, he gets zero under Penn Central, right? He's going to keep nothing. He gets nothing from the government. But if he gets 100%, he'll get the full value of his property. And Justice Stevens says, why does this make sense? Why are we giving so much money to someone for 100% but no compensation if it's 95%, 97%, 99%, no compensation is afforded? Okay. Scalia replied, maybe not persuasively, in property, they'll have all nothing propositions. And with a bright line rule, sometimes you win. And then with Penn Central, you're going to lose. Okay. Now, there's a limitation, though, on this holding. And the limitation is how to check. Right? The Supreme Court does not overrule how to check. They reaffirm it. And the court says that the government can still prohibit a harmful, noxious use, even if, even if it diminishes the value by 100%. In other words, the government can simply say, you can't do anything in your land because we're prohibiting a noxious use. But what's the rub? What's the trick that Scalia does? Can the legislature just decree anything a harmful, noxious use? No. Can the legislature declare a new harmful use whenever they want? No. What Scalia says is only those harmful, noxious uses that existed at common law will qualify. In other words, if this was a harmful use that was known back in the day, whenever that day was, it's covered. But this some sort of novel environmental concern that didn't exist 100 years ago, too bad. The way Scalia explains it is what sort of background principles are inherent in your title, right? When Mr. Lucas bought his property, he knew he couldn't make a lot of noise, he couldn't make a lot of smoke, he couldn't uh, uh, engage in uh, vibrations, right? All the nuisances you guys study in torts. He knew that. Those background principles adhered. They were inherent in his title. But what South Carolina did was different. They said, we have this new problem, beach erosion. It's new. We didn't really think about it before. And we need to stop it. And it's dangerous. If we have beach erosion, people might get killed. Scalia says, too bad. Right? Because this nuisance did not exist in common law, you cannot legislate it. In other words, only those nuisances, only those harmful, noxious uses that existed in common law will get you to have a check. Now, was banning the baking of bricks an actual common law nuisance? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Doesn't really grapple with that. But he got five votes for it, so he got five votes. Uh, Justice O'Connor went along with this. So I want to modify your chart one more time. Under Lucas, wherever you see the word harmful, noxious use, I want you to put CL, common law, right? No common law harmful noxious uses. No common law harmful or noxious uses. Right. Why is this important? Because the legislature cannot decree new noxious uses. The court will only recognize those harmful uses that exist at common law. And by the way, preview, on remand, the South Carolina Supreme Court said, no, beach erosion was not recognized at common law as a nuisance. Therefore, you can build your house with Lucas. Or the government wants to stop you, they have to pay you. But they can't do both. Tell you good? Lee, we good? Sorry. Sorry. Just to clarify, what for the what existed at common law? The harmful or noxious uses that existed at so common law. So it just had to be at the start of whatever. A little fuzzy in the details, but I think what Scalia is saying is you can't just make new ones. 
right? In other words, if in the modern day the legislature says we are decreeing this in ostrich use, that won't cut it. You have to have some standard from before the law being enacted. And and in a way, this sort of frees society, doesn't it? Um, Justice Stevens' dissent, I don't think this is in your book, but Justice Stevens' dissent invokes what case? Lochner. Right? Everything, everything, I told you, everything goes back to Lochner. These people are obsessed, the judges. They can't, they can't get away from it. This poor baker in upstate New York just want to just want to eat baker's bread. I can't eat bread today, but uh, it's bread. It's just, it's just good enough. I, I have sympathy. Uh, no sympathy. I can't eat anything, right? Um, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, Everything is bread, by the way. If you think about it, everything has wheat and yeast in it. You you don't know how much maybe if you have a gluten allergy, you know, but it, it's hard to eat. Anyway, yeah, Zach. It's, it's the yeast that's the problem, right? The yeast is the problem. But but uh, there's starch, there's wheat in almost everything you eat, every shortening. Anyway. Is, is wheat included? Yeah, no, it's all the grains. Oh, okay. All the grains. And we can't eat corn, we can't eat peanuts, we can't eat beans, there are all these other prescriptions that are just sort of potatoes. Potatoes are okay. So a lot of potatoes, a lot of eggs. Uh, my uh, my cholesterol shoots up this week. It's bad. I have eggs almost every day for breakfast. Anyway, uh, back back to law. Um, no Jew, Jewish law is it's, it's arcane. There's millions. Of things, right? Sorry, we're all lawyers. Um, <laughs> TMI. Okay. Anyway, um, Scalia says only those nuisances that existed at common law will qualify. But this does free society, right? In other words. Society can't react to change <laughs> circumstances, right? You have this new phenomenon, beach erosion, and the government can't deal with these novel situations without paying massive amounts, million dollars compensation. That, that's just million dollars for one guy. Imagine the entire lot, how many houses you have to pay off. And this is, again, taxpayer money. It's not like the government just prints money out of thin air. All right, states can't do that. Okay? All right. Yes? Oh, I thought your hand went up. No, that's, that's okay. All right. So again, Scalia makes two findings. First, the land was valueless. And second, there was no common law harmful nuisance. So this is the categorical test. If there's no common law harmful nuisance, and are you at 100% diminution of value, guess what? You get paid. You get your compensation. And that's why the majority felt that compensation was warranted in this case. And again, on remand, the South Carolina Supreme Court said, yeah, there's no harmful use here. Um, categorical taking, pay up. How are we doing? Everyone get the majority. Everyone get why Scalia did what he did. What he did. Okay. Uh, Justices Blackman and Stevens wrote dissents. Uh, Justice Blackman gave this very fam famous line, today the court launches a missile to kill a mouse. In other words, he thought this was extreme overkill, right? Mm -hmm. For a very small, uh, I should say a small problem, but for a, uh, a, a rare problem where the government needs time to block construction to save the beaches, the court comes and says, no, you have to pay for it. Uh, and just, Justice Stevens says, you're freezing the common law in place. Um, now, the last part of the, of the dissent, I think, actually makes a fair point. Was the land valueless? Right? Was the land valueless? And you might remember with property, you think of the bundle of sticks, right? The bundle of rights. Um, what's the most essential stick in the bundle? The right to exclude. Does Mr. Lucas still have the right to exclude people? Yeah. You can't trespass on his land. Does he have the right to sell? Yeah. Can he have guests over? Sure he can. They just can't build anything. Can they go uh, 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 bring a tent? Have a picnic, go swimming, go fishing, bring a trailer? Yes, yes, and yes. So is it really the case that there's zero economic value? Right? Maybe it's like 1% or 0.1%, but there's some number, right? There's some value retained. This is not valueless land as the child court found. Um, the key move, though, is Scalia's economically viable use. Right, that's the test Scalia uses, economically viable. Right, why? It might be various recreational or familial uses, but it's not economic. You can't use it. You can't build. And Justice Stevens replies, why is it only economically valued? Right, why can't it have a non-economic use like fishing or camping? Okay. But Stevens was in dissent, and he lost. He would win in a few minutes, right, when we get to the other case. 
But at least in 1992, Stevens was in dissent. Uh, Justice Blackman retired. He was replaced by Justice Breyer a couple years later, uh, and the votes would sort of move around. Okay, questions on Lucas. Zach, is that a hand? I'll start. Okay. All right, questions on Lucas. Okay. All right, so what happened after Lucas? I know you all read the notes, of course. The notes discuss, I'm being sarcastic. The notes discuss how courts didn't really like Lucas. And most state courts didn't really apply Lucas in the wake of the decision. They simply just sort of followed Penn Central and they ignored Lucas. But during this entire time, during the 80s and 90s, it was a dispute at Lake Tahoe. Has anyone ever been to Lake Tahoe? Yeah, you've been there? Yeah, what's it like? You like it? Yeah. Beautiful? Sure. Why is the water so special there? What's what's so special about it? I don't know, but uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, I lived in Northern California, and we had a house by Lake Tahoe. You had a house by Lake Tahoe? Oh, very nice. I wonder if it was near Mr. Uh, uh, near the Tahoe Sierra Preservation Council. All right, very good. All right, so Lake Tahoe, again, I've never been there, so I can't speak to it in person, but I've seen pictures. And it has this very distinctive blue water. Um, and it's due to a number of ecological factors they don't fully understand, but it's very unique. But starting in the 1960s, a lot of houses were built near Lake Tahoe. Anyone ever see The Godfather Part Two? Right? They built they have a house near Lake Tahoe, right? Okay. It's a good movie, very good movie. Um, now, there's a problem. When you build something, you're converting soil to concrete and asphalt. So when it rains, the rain doesn't get absorbed into the soil it runs off, it's called runoff. And it runs off into the lake. And all this additional water was affecting the ecology in the lake. And as a result, the blue water was turning green. And the government determined that if we don't slow the rate of development, the lake would lose its clarity forever, or at least for 700 years or something close to it, right? But it would be very hard to retain the beautiful blue. So California and Nevada formed this compact, this uh, Tahoe Regional Planning Authority that would um, figure out what to do. All right. Now, who wants to give me the facts here in Tahoe Sierra? Anyone? Oh, you guys. No one? Zach, go ahead. Um, so the city of Tahoe is this um, regional planning agency that they're using to... Um, affect the, the regulation of what you can and cannot do around Lake Tahoe for the purpose of preventing the water from no longer being the pretty blue that it is. Um, so a bunch of real estate owners that were affected um, by the moratorium that the uh, agency laid out to stop them from developing mm -hmm. um, uh, come together and filed suit to um, <clears throat> have the Moratorium declared an unconstitutional taking so that they can get compensation. They're trying to play the total takings test from Lucas um, game, but as applied to a temporary rather than permanent total takings. Okay, very good. Thank you for that, Zach. Okay, so here we have a situation where the government says um, we have this ecological crisis. We need a pause. They go to moratorium. We need to pause for a period of about two years. And during this time, we will develop a plan. We'll put together a strategy to figure out how to have sound environmental growth. Um, like most government agencies, they didn't estimate properly how much time they would need. Right? That, that happens with all government. A couple of government officials in my office. She, does government ever work on schedule? No, sir. All right. But did everything go okay with the uh, with the uh, final four with your, your SWAT thing? Everything good? No, 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 no activities. Did you have that guy who pretended to be a cop? Did you have to deal with him or no to get into the concert? Okay, yeah, I've read it. So the guy pretended to be a cop to get into a concert or something. He had like a vest on, saying like you know, what, what was the vest say something? 
He's just delivering Amazon, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, they said we need to take two years to do a plan. And, of course, they didn't finish it. So they added another moratorium for another eight months. And by uh, April of 84, they actually finally adopted their plan. But during this 32-month period, all development was banned, right? You couldn't build anything. All right. So you're the lawyer for this, this organization, which is called the Tahoe Sierra Preservation Council. And even though it's called preservation, their goal is to build. So it's a, it's sort of a curiously named group, right? You think, oh, it's an environmental group. No, no, they want to build, right? So they want to preserve their homes, I guess. That, that's, preserve their property values. I don't know. Uh, so this group files a lawsuit against the, um, the the planning authority, and they argue that the two moratoriums were takings. Now, again, they filed suit in 1984. That was like eight years before Lucas. And they actually litigated this case under Penn Central initially, where they were going to lose, but they still litigated the case. But then we get 1992, and we get Lucas. And finally, the trial court rules that the property was deprived of all economically viable use for 32 months. Therefore, there was a taking. Did it matter the taking was only temporary? The court said no, right? Lucas did not draw a distinction between permanent and temporary takings. Let's say that one again. Lucas did not draw a distinction between permanent and temporary takings. Justice Kennedy did. Justice Scalia did not. So therefore, the trial court ordered about a million dollar in damages to be paid to the, I'm sorry, wrong case. The trial court ordered uh, damages to be paid under the categorical takings doctrine. Uh, the Ninth Circuit reversed. And the Ninth Circuit said, aha, there was no categorical taking because it was only temporary. It was only for 32 months. Let's think about this for a minute. How long was the moratorium in effect in South Carolina? Two years, right? He couldn't build for two years. How long was the moratorium in effect in Tahoe? 32 months, a little bit more than two years. So somehow, two years was a permanent taking in Lucas, but 32 months was only temporary in the Ninth Circuit. Go figure. Okay. The case was then appealed to the Supreme Court. And just, I want you to pause. The case began in 1984. It went to the Supreme Court in 2002. Can you imagine litigating for 18 years to get compensation at this point. I mean, I mean, the people who live there are like, you know, retiring at some point, right? I mean, it's probably not the original owners. Uh, litigation against the government takes forever, especially in the Ninth Circuit, uh, because it went up and down and up and down. Now, here the votes changed. Why? Well, for one, Justice White was replaced by Justice Ginsburg. And White was in the majority in Lucas. He voted with Stevens. But then the key vote was Sandra Day O'Connor. Justice O'Connor switched her vote. She voted with the majority in Lucas and the majority in Tahoe Sierra. And how do you know that Justice Stevens was begging O'Connor to come along? He keeps talking about her. He says, well, you know, Justice O'Connor wrote this beautiful concurrence. It's so wise. And Paula Zala wrote out. Let's see what O'Connor said. So there was a time when, o when O'Connor was the most powerful people in the country, right? Advocates for the Supreme Court would say they would, if they could put O'Connor's face on the cover of a brief, they would do that, right? Because they were just making all the arguments for her. She was that significant. So here, really, O'Connor flipped the court. Had she went with Scalia, the vote might have gone differently, but this was six to three. So again, Stevens had the majority, Rehnquist wrote the principal dissent, and Thomas wrote his second dissent. So we have a problem here, right? Under Lucas, we have our test here. I wrote it here, black and white. Is building a house a common law nuisance? Of course not, right? Is Tao Sierra depriving all economic viable use? Under Lucas standard, yeah, they can't build. It's the exact same injury suffered by Lucas, right? You can't build a house. That's no economically viable use. Camping, fishing doesn't count. So why... Why doesn't the court find a taking under 2B? So here's where things get sort of messy. Justice Stevens, very smart judge, adds a wrinkle to Lucas. He adds a wrinkle. He says, Lucas does not control the opinion here. What does he say? Lucas only imposed a categorical rule when a regulation 
permanently, that's the key word, permanently deprives an owner of all economically beneficial use. Permanently. Lucas was permanent, apparently. Tao Sierra was temporary. Again, what Stevens is very crafty. He said Lucas is limited to permanent deprivations of value forever, ever, ever. But in Tahoe Sierra, it was temporary, only 32 months. And how does he justify that rule? Our good friend, Penn Central, and our good friend, Justice Brandeis' dissent in Penn Cole. He says, we can't just look at the 32-month period of the moratorium. We must look at the parcel as a whole. Oh, it didn't. Justice Brandis, I told you, would get the last laugh. He came back 100 years later. Justice Stevens said we need to look at the parcel as a whole. Property is not just about legal and physical dimensions. Property has a temporal dimension. It's back to the future, right? It's not just length, width, and height. It's time. It's the fourth dimension, right? We look at time. It's all relative, I suppose. right? We look at time. The parcel as a whole includes time. And since the moratorium only lasted 30-something months, that was a temporary taking. So I want you to modify, again, I'm so sorry, those of you taking notes by hand, I, I apologize in advance. You guys ready for this last one? Uh, not last, but close to the last one. I want you to have the word before deprive in bold, permanently. That now the deprivation of value must be permanent. Now, that restriction did not exist in Justice Lee's opinion. The, the Tahoe Court didn't be added that. So that's the rules. It must be permanent. If it's not permanent, if it's not permanent, then you go to Penn Central. Again, if it's not a permanent taking, guess what, guys? You're in Penn Central. You lose. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go directly to jail because you lose. So you see what Stevens did? By adding the word permanent there, he basically destroyed Lucas. Lucas will almost never apply. Why? Because the government's not stupid. The government will say, oh, this is just a temporary moratorium. It's just temporary. Just for a couple years. A couple years. What's the big deal? Um, during the oral argument, Chief Justice Rehnquist asked John Roberts, what if it was five years? Robert's like, eh, what if it was 10 years? Robert's like, oh, 10 years maybe is too long. What if it was 30 years? Well, 30 years is definitely too long, right? So permanence becomes a very hard balancing issue, right? The court injected a balancing test to what was previously a categorical test. Scalia did not intend that to happen. I'm sure he was very upset. Okay. Uh, you don't need to, but you can. It doesn't really matter at this point. I, I wouldn't even add it. Because if it's not permanent here, then you, you drop down to C. So it doesn't really matter. I wouldn't add because it confuses more than it adds. Okay. So you see what Justice, yeah, uh, Casey, then Kirk. got to be both. That's where there's an end there, right? So the only circumstance we actually use a Lucas categorical test is where there's no harmful common law use and there's a permanent 100% deprivation value in both of them. That's to be very rare, right? The government will simply say, oh, this is temporary, or they'll have like a permitting process. I think in Tahoe, it takes like 20 years to build anything anyway, right? So nothing will ever get built. I, that's why I sort of chuckle as they get a house there. I'm sure if I was old, you know? Yes, sir. New uses can be very rare. That's exactly right. I was just wondering because it seemed like the Court of Appeals opinion essentially was to make the application of Lucas as rare as you've mentioned, the application of Penn Central pretty much is. Always. But and and again, it was almost teed up for Stevens because Stevens had obviously descended in Lucas. And then but where I'm I'm kind of grappling this this concept, I think there's temporary 
slice of the fee interest. Right. But it says, and he says, uh, the Court of Appeals said that it's a form of regulation that's widespread and well established. And I really feel like there's no distinction between Todd and Lucas in those cases. They're both new ecological developments that cause it. The, like the, the difference. The difference is that the statute enacted in 1988 did not have a logical end date. It said no building period. Oh, okay. Whereas the moratorium, the theory said we're going to stop for two years and then we'll see what happens. Okay. Right? But there's no prohibition against adding another eight months under eight months. That's not allowed. Right? The statute, one second, the statute in South Carolina said no building period. That was, was modified later, but that was not necessarily going to happen. The two year moratorium in Tahoe. At least had something to end date in mind. I'm a little thrown by your use of the and in step C uh -huh. because uh, you, you see, you see what I know. I know. Should, should that be an or? No, I don't do or. Uh, <laughs> no, I know what you're party? saying. I know what you're saying. Don't leave this at You don't do or functions? I don't do it. If both those things are true, there's no harmful use, and it does not deprive all economic use. You go to Penn Central. I think that's correct. Right, again, under the, the step B. No, I'm um, doing step C. It does not, there's a not there, and does not deprive all economic and viable use. Uh, oh, okay. It, it's the no in front of the harmful and noxious use. It's, it's no seal harmful and noxious use, and does okay. not. Right, so the double right logic, not A and not B is A or A. Yeah, I don't. I, Leave, leave it as is, because it's parallel. It's symmetry. You're wrong. Remember logic, remember not A, not A and B is equal to A or B. So how do you get around the or problem? Okay, moving on. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so just to confirm, like, when the government says it'll take it like, another 32 months, they can continue to extend it indefinitely, and it still will never be considered. That's what Rankle says is the sense. The majority doesn't really make that point. Um, but I think what the majority would say is if it's in good faith, it's okay. Let's say that after three, two months, they're just not done yet. There's more time to plan. It's a big lake, right? In the other eight months, that'd be okay. But if there's evidence of bad faith that they're just renewing it for eight months and twiddling their fingers, that would not be okay. That's not the thing I would answer your question. But the key move that Justice Stevens makes is permanence. Once he draws a line between permanent and temporary takings, Lucas becomes a nullity. Because the government will never just straight up say you can never build. They'll just create a process that takes 30 years to build, and you know, during that time, you know, things will stay more or less the same. And and Rehnquist makes this point in his dissent. He's like, you're just rewarding governments who just sort of use labels, right? If you call it a ban, that's not okay. If you call it a temporary moratorium, that's fine. So really the labeling of the policy matters more than the actual economic impact of the property owners. So in the end, the court says, we do not follow the Lucas categorical test. We use our familiar Penn Central balancing, and guess what? You lose. I mean, he didn't say that, but that's what happens, right? You lose when you go to Penn Central. And that's what exactly as Stevens wanted it, right? Stevens had dissented, as Kirk mentioned, in the top, in, this, in Lucas case. He was not happy about it, and he got his votes 10 years later to, to basically not reverse Lucas, to wipe it out. Yes, Aaron. Uh, so, the common law modifier that we added to the um, to the test. Mm -hmm. I mean, to to is that still like, I guess, functioning like still good law, yeah. But it's very rare where it actually matters, because so long as it's not called permanent, it doesn't even matter. In other words, to be right, the Lucas test is used very rarely. There are very few cases that fit into the rubric of, of, of Lucas precisely because the government's smart. And they're, maybe I'm saying they're smart, but they, they learn their lesson and they won't call it a permanent moratorium. They'll say it's temporary. Okay. Everyone get the uh, the reversal in Lucas. I'm sorry, in, in Tahoe Sierra. So, I mean, this it's it's a hard case for students because you have one case saying one thing, right? You have another case saying another thing goes in the opposite direction. So, at least for our purposes today, we'll get to the Roberts work in a couple classes. At least for our purposes today, how is still the law? So, generally, if you're litigating a regulatory takings case, 
you will be stuck in Penn Central land. No matter how hard you try to escape, no matter how much you want a categorical test, you will be relegated to the world of Penn Central, in which case you're going to lose. I mean, you're not always going to lose, but you're probably going to lose. Right? It's, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's, it's aliens, right? You're, you're, you know the meme, right? You're going to lose. Yes, sir. So now with this taco test, if it's a temporary taking, yes. you have to go Penn Central. Penn Central only. Penn Central. One way train. All right, it's a one way stop. And you lose. <laughs> I mean, again, there are cases where you win under Penn Central. I don't want to say it's never. Blood cases, you might win, right? It's bloody. Uh, there are also cases involved. You've already built something, say, stop building, right? You might win there if you're invested money. But generally, if it's some new construction, you're going to lose. Right? Let's go back up to our list of cases. Um, Let me modify this one more time. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll make sure your notes are clean on this one. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. No. Uh, no, no, this this one's good. This this one's good. I want to go up to the top to our list of cases and just add the the the, the new cases that we studied for today. If I can right. Okay, so Lucas held that when there's a one hundred percent diminution in economic value, there's a categorical taking, right? And that's great. Then we have Lucas as modified by Tahoe. Okay, and the key move there, it is 100% permanent diminution economic value, otherwise Penn Central. Again, the key move from Lucas as modified by Tahoe asks if the diminution economic value is permanent. All right. Questions. Questions. The diminution of value test came from Penn Coal. Is you correct? got it. Yeah. I mean, all the cases eventually go back to Penn Coal and had a check. It's kind of scary, right? These are 100 year old cases from judges who are not thinking about modern issues, but everything goes back to Penn Coal and had a check. Penn Central tried to make sense of Penn Coal. Lucas tried to limit Penn Central, and then Tahoe just said, nope, go right back to Penn Central. So we're still stuck in Brennan's world, no matter how hard we try to escape, right? There's, there's, there's no escaping. It's one of the circles of hell, I suppose, right? Um, Brennan world. But, but we're still stuck there. Okay. Questions? All right, let me walk through the flowchart one more time and I'll let, let you go and you can go uh, go get something to relax. And, sorry, sorry, I, I stopped myself. You can go relax for a little bit. No, it's, I, I have to be respectful. I, I, try, I try hard. I don't want to see, but I try. Okay. Um, so we have to distinguish between categorical tests and balancing tests, right? With a categorical test, plaintiff's going to win. With a balancing test, the government's going to win. Right? That's just going to happen almost every time. Uh, so when you approach a takings question on the exam, I know you're going to hate me, but you need to do this. I know you're going to hate me. I'll show you how to do it well, how to do it within this, the word limit. I know it's a concern. It can be done. It's done every year. But you have to think about these questions, right? So the first question is, are you dealing with a current physical occupation? In which case, Loretto, categorical test. Easy. I give you this question, you are blessed. You stop. Right? That, that, that's over. You over at step one. But I usually don't do that. Right? Unfortunately. Um, you then ask, is there a permanent physical occupation? No. Okay. So then we would either A, B, or C. If there's a common law, this is the important point that Lucas gives us. This was not overruled. If there's a common law noxious or harmful use, there's no compensation. But the key point is it must be a common law nuisance. Can't be something that legislative, leg, 
legislatively decreed. You can't have a new one. And, and whatever exam facts we're going to give you, uh, it's got to be what you have been towards, right? What the common law business Building by a beach is not a common law business. So an ecological concern would not qualify. We're not done. Let's say that there's no common law harmful noxious use. You then go to diminution in value. Specifically, is there a permanent diminution in value? If the answer is yes, that is that there's no common law nuisance and there's a permanent diminution value, congratulations, you squeezed into Lucas. But it's be very rare that you actually confront the Lucas taking. They just don't occur very often. More likely what happens is 2C. There is no common law harmful noxious use and and that and it does not deprive of all economically viable use that there's still some use left over in that world you go to consensual balancing and you lose congratulations yes sir so in Hadachak, the baking of bricks uh that was sexually yeah it was well, it doesn't address that. I think there's a good argument that the, bake, that the brick baking had a chef was not a common law nuisance. Right? So there are no allegations of fumes or smoke or noise or anything else. To double up on that, had, I'm sorry, Muggler versus Kansas was the reference in the reading. Muggler versus, I'm sorry, I don't want to start with computer. Muggler versus Kansas involves a law that banned the uh, brewing of alcoholic beverages. And they just shut that down. A common law was making wine or beer a nuisance? No. So uh, I don't think Scalia grounds his common law exception in the cases. It's sort of just this ad hoc exception. What he really wants to say is you can't make up new stuff. If you want to restrict a usage, you have to show some historical basis for it. But I'm not sure that how to check or muggle and follow that principle. Yes, Talia? Um, just, <clears throat> I know you say you're going to teach us like how to go through it. And that you said it always goes back to have a check and fit hole. But it's not on the how you do it. So do you just have it at the end or do you just don't bring it up? Do this. Okay. Yeah. I mean do it in this order if you can. Pen cold by itself doesn't really have much weight. You always talk about it because it's just Holmes. People love Justice Holmes. They venerate him way too much overrated, right? But he hasn't really fit on the framework. And if you, if you actually wanted to put him in, this language of diminution of value is really all. Right? This language about permanent deprivation or you know, the value of the coal was wiped out. So that's really where Ken Cole comes in, but it's really not directly endorsed in that way. Right? If you walk into court and they said, Your Honor, this violates Ken Cole, they only give you more recent cases. Right? Give me Penn Central, give me Google. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No? All right, have a lovely evening. I will see you all on Thursday, and thank you for your attention. Can we be so kind to roll the, the slide back up to the case? Where do you want to go up? Over here? Yeah. Okay. Professor? Yes, sir. Should we take the practice exam line or notes? I would bring whatever notes you have. It won't help you.